But for this first half an hour, I'm delighted to be joined by a man who had a brilliant career in the saddle. Quite a brief career by today's standards, but a brilliant one, most notably because he rode for the most powerful stable in the country, which housed some of the most extraordinary household names at one time. Pendle, Crisp, Lanzarotti, Bueller, Killiney and many more. Uh, John Frankham then succeeded him and he went on to become uh, one of the best loved television commentators for many a year on the BBC. He is of course Richard Pittman. Richard, good morning and welcome to Luck on Sunday. Yes, I worry about the best loved, but anyway, you know, uh, we had a good time for 35 years, yeah. Well, I, I certainly enjoyed it. I mean, it was part of my childhood listening yeah, you to you, on, young, the, yeah, on, the, you on, the, on the BBC and your, your <laughs> voice was synonymous with, with many a big race at the Cheltenham Festival and the Grand National. Do you miss it? Yeah, but everything's a phase in life, isn't it? I mean, the, the Beeb stopped televising in 2012, due to money, of course, couldn't compete. And our last day was Grand National when uh, I was on. It, it was sad, but you move on, Nick. I mean, there's another phase in life. What's waiting for me out there? So what are you doing now? Um, I, I buy horses for uh, three American friends, including Charlie Fenwick, who rode yes. Ben Nevis to win the National, uh, Mary Bell Stables. We buy them here to go to the States for timber racing or uh, proper racing, grade ones, uh, jumping, we've, we've done that. And I also oversee his, their horses here. We've got six with Hannon, uh, two with Mark Johnson, two with Osborne, two with Rafe Beckett, three with Willie Mullins. So there's plenty of action around, you know. So it keeps you busy and you enjoy that side of oh, it. Oh, love it, love it. And the American jumping is making a bit of a resurgence, isn't it? Money, isn't it? That's what does it. You know, 450 grand for the American Grand National, which, of course, was won by Nicky Henderson this year and Gordon Elliott the year before. I wonder if they'll put a block on, uh, on foreigners coming in. But has the game always been motivated by money? I was thinking about back to the time when, when you were running. I mean, it, it's before I can remember, but these horses are such legendary names that they stand the test of time. I mentioned the Bueller, Pendle, Chris, Lanzarotti, Kalani, and so many more. Uh, was it about money then, the, the jump racing game, or was it just about the love of the sport? No, no, uh, wasn't I lucky uh, not to be riding for people who wanted a punt. You know, all our owners were happy if a big, backward, fat Irish horse store finished third at Ascot first time out at 20 to 1. Delighted. You know, there was none of this old give it a run. Mm -hmm. I was never asked to stop a horse, but I did twice uh, in big races. I stopped one in the Grand National and one in the Gold Cup through incompetence. <laughs> <laughs> so what sort of atmosphere do you think jump racing had within it then that it, it doesn't have now? Oh, great camaraderie. But it, it couldn't have existed. Is it? No sport, you know, we're talking 50 years ago, you mm. know, no sport could be what it was then. Uh, it's become commercial, hasn't it? You know, and therefore the, the players have become commercial. I mean, look, nutritionist drivers, we never had a driver. Um, I mean, Franken, when he used to drive, he'd get up, when he was bored or going up the motorway and nobody would take the wheel, he'd just get up and, while he's on the, in the fast lane and get in the back. <laughs> so whoever's in the front is all of a sudden a lot. I mean, you know, it was a, and before John Frank took over and, and things changed, Frank and Scudamore and it's gone on, Dunwoody and, and, and McCoy, of course, it was more of a cavalier mm. sport. You know, Biddlecombe, the great curly blonde bear, everyone loved him. You know, Josh Gifford, Mella. It, it was a different day, big Dave Dick. People loved them. Is that why careers were necessarily briefer? Because you lived harder, lived faster, you didn't have the nutritional advice, you weren't it, supreme athletes, perhaps, yeah. like they are now. And I don't think we were as fit, anywhere near as fit. You know, I mean, they really are fit now. It, you, know, you know, you're a good rider yourself, you bridge your, rein, your reins over the neck of the horse. <laughs> I'm definitely not a good rider, Richard. <laughs> but we used to have a rest halfway round on the bridge of the reins. They get your breath back and then go again. Now, look at Dickie Johnson. I, I mean, never stopped pushing and, and McCoy was in, incredible in that area. I mean, if I told you all those years ago that people would still be riding, we've got a, a jockey in riding at the peak of his powers into his 40s later in the programme, Leighton Aspel. If I told you that people would be riding at 42, 43, 44 at the top level, you, you probably wouldn't have believed me. No, jumping. I mean, Josh Gifford retired at 29. Mm. Uh, Fred Winter went on till he was 38, I think. I did 32. But I had to move on, A, because I had a job with the BBC, but B, I could not contain John Frankham any longer. He was... you know, only have the one eye to know. He was patently better. Um, he, he was, I couldn't have contained him. And Fred Winter said to me when I retired uh, on the muck hill, we were both forking the muck up, you mm. see, in the morning. Um, he said, look, Richard, I told him about the job with the baby. He said, look, you've got a job here. 
as long as you consider yourself good enough to ride my horses. But you'd be sharing them with John, obviously. So wasn't that a nice thing to do? It was a lovely thing to do. It, uh, it was your misfortune, I suppose, that he happened to be the greatest jockey that oh, anyone had ever seen at the time. Great man. But a great person. He's my hero. I mean, Fred Winder was my hero. And then Franken became my hero. To have two heroes and be with them, marvellous. So take me back to, to the beginning, where it started, and how you ended up at Fred Winter's. Well, Nick, I'd been four years as a pro, going around little stables around Cheltenham, where I was born, mm -hmm. and thinking, small stable, you'll get a chance. I, that's not the way. You ride something with one eye and three bad legs. The moment there's fa the only fancied horse of the year, you don't ride it, you know. They put a jockey on. So after four years, I thought, if, there, if there's a trainer having winners and you get in at the bottom, yeah. the crumbs off the table will feed you. So that, and, and I worked out that Fred Winter would be retiring that year, and I approached him uh, long before, said, can I join you? He said, yes, I've watched you. And he said, you're honest, and horses jump better for you than a lot of people. He said, you'll do me. But you'll never be champion jockey. But you'll do me. Why did he? Why did he say with such confidence you'll never be champion jockey? Uh, because he thought that there were so many better: Jeff King, Andy Turnell, um, Johnny Hayne, the, the three Turnell jockeys. But there were better jockeys. But he liked the attributes I had, which was honesty and the jumping ability. And also, sorry, Nick, to, I don't want to blow my own trumpet. But, I want you to, that's uh, but, why you're here. But Jeff, Jeff King was very acerbic, mm -hmm. you know, and real tough. And Andy Turnell was quiet as a church man. Mm. And I love people. People fascinate me. Wherever I go, you know, I love people. If they're not interesting, don't talk to them. But most people are. And so therefore, I, I really joined up with the owners. You know, I didn't follow them around and keep telling them how beautiful they were, you know. But we, we, we talked about the horses. Mm. And uh, did you have an inclination right from the word go? Obviously, Fred Winter had been a fantastic rider. Did you have an inclination that he would be instantly so successful as a trainer, or was it happenstance for you? No, I knew he would be because he had such a charisma, and he rode for a lot of the American owners um, who I subsequently rode. They had horses with us: Ogden Phipps, Mrs. Valentine, mm -hmm. oh, loads of Dupont Scott. You know, the Duponts in America, are huge, aren't they? Um, so they, they, they were going to send good horses. We also had uh, two movie moguls and uh, Hayley Mills. And in the early days, you know, it was marvellous. Uh, they were coming. Cohen was one of them. Nat Cohen and two brothers, I can't remember. They came for evening stay, you see, so we were all told to be yards as clean and all that sort of thing. But I was a bit of a jack the lad and in the yard was a guy called redvers weaver who rode and he was very specific so i pinched his head collars you know lovely lovely leather head collars with brasses on them mm -hmm. his brasses were all shiny and the leather was good and i pinched his head collars just as they were arriving put them on my horses you see so when they came round. Uh, Hayley, Hayley Mills gave me 20 quid and said, your, your head collars are just outstanding, you see. On she went, and there, poor old Red Weaver had got my dirty leather head collars with green <laughs> brass on them. <laughs> so when they moved on around the yard, he called me out. And I'd never had a fight in my life, a physical fight, you see. Mm. And, and he called me out, so I said, defend yourself, you're like an old pugilist. <laughs> so, I didn't, and while I'm defending myself, one on the chin, I'm lying on the ground in a puddle, just as Hayley Mills comes round the corner. So there was, there was a certain glamour to the, to the oh, sport in those right, days. Right, from the, but the opposite side, side of the scale was, the stables were there, but there was no accommodation, and yeah. we lived in, not, to, not touring, uh, not, not mobile homes, little touring cameras, little mm. ones like that. You know, I had to go up to the Louvre in the wood and, uh, you know, that was life. But we didn't care. When you were young, you'd do anything, wouldn't you? Yeah, I was going to say, did you mind? Did it occur to you that you weren't exactly living in the lap of luxury? No, I knew what to, what to expect because um, when Fred Winter wrote to me in the summer, because, you know, it used to be two months off then, he wrote to me, he said, Dear Pittman, uh, really looking forward to you starting with me on, whenever it was, uh, June the 1st. Um, I, I have no accommodation at the moment, but I can assure you that the tennis pavilion is very warm at this time of year. You'll be fine. <laughs> you, you mentioned his charisma. Just 
put a bit of meat on the bones for me. Just tell me a bit more about what he was like. I don't remember him yeah. really in his, yeah. in his pom. He'd have been a great man at, uh, at anything. Just go back to the Red Weaver incident where I'm lying in the puddle. He picked me up by the ear mm -hmm. and got hold of Red's arm, took us out. He said, look, this is disgraceful, you know. Took us into the tennis court, locked the gate and said, sort it out and come out as men, not boys. You know, very fair. Only said, and give Red Weaver that 20 quid back. <laughs> you know, a great man. I know you'll get on to Chris later, most people seem to, sooner or later, but um, when he was beaten in the Grand National in a glaring error, a riding error, which is why I'm against the use of the whip, because I misused it and lost a huge race as a result, uh, we, we drove home, we drove for three weeks racing, I used to drive him in his car, I'd been beaten on a lot of favourites in the interim, won a lot of races, and he just said one day, you know where you lost that race? Well, I'd lost quite a few in the three weeks. I said, yes. He said, well, there's no point talking about it. If you know, no point, is there? You know, it wasn't going to change the result. I knew what I'd done wrong, so. So your, your respect for him, your regard for him, never wavered in all the time oh, he rode? No, he was just a great man in everything he did. The hardest puller in the yard, 177, horrible thing, pulled like stink. He rode it, he rode himself. In, in, you know, in the in, in exercise. There are an awful lot of topics I, I wanted to cover this morning, and I very was very happy to to leave Crisp until later in the program, or yeah, well, maybe not. Or don't even talk it's, about it. it it's, <laughs> it's so well documented. But is there something inside you that instinctively feels that you need to you need to talk about it? You need to keep apologising well, for it. You need to absolve yourself somehow of the responsibility yes. for this. Just look at this. I can hear a horse coming. I don't know what it is, but I can hear him because the ground was quite fast. It's very shortly now. Look, I. I get hold of him and think I've got to wake him up, but I want to go right-handed round the elbow. No, we've got to jump the last yet. Yeah, just pop it. That uh, was all right. We've got to go right-handed, and yet I pick my stick up in my right hand. Look, the crack down there, give, and I'm already wavering off of course. That was a basic, stupid error. We've wasted ground. We've lost momentum. It's something that. Young, well, young jockeys look at that and burst out laughing now because the race is gone. I mean, Chris tired, he's at the bottom of the barrel. Even his floppy ears, Nick, have gone even floppier. Look, they were pointing down. And then I can hear Red Run coming, <laughs> high blowing, drum drum with his feet on the turf. It was an awful thing, and you know, cut the strides all over. Do you actually think you'd have won if you hadn't picked yourself? Yeah. Yeah, for, the, for two reasons. It was the last two strides we were beaten. Mm -hmm. Had I just kept him balanced, this is why I'm against the stick, or if I'd used it in the left hand, because I want to go right around the, the elbow, he'd have gone that way. Instead, I picked it up on the right hand. He's drifted left. I've had to stop and pull him onto a stride again to get round. It's, it was... Half a length was it, or something? I don't. Know. But is, that's an example of injudicious use of the of the stick. I don't really understand why that would make you against its use full stop if it's used correctly. A horse isn't there where the winning post is, and four and a half miles around Aintree is very different to five furlongs at York. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally see that. Because of the ground, I suppose, in the flat races, they they are less. Uh, they use it less than jump jockeys do, and it looks pretty ugly in wet ground at the end of a race, horses going backwards and they're being larruped, you know. They're far better off. As I say, you keep hold of a horse's head, keep him balanced. What does the stick do? The moment you pick it up, you lose their head with, because you've only got one hand on the reins. So they wander. If they're tired, they weigh half a ton. You know, you want to keep them balanced, keep them going. Uh, uh, Nick, sorry, I can see you're just about to ask another question, but there's something here, old brain. I'm very strong on the whip, and I've yet, I defy anyone to come up with a video clip and say, this jockey saved the horse from doing that because he had a stick. Something like might bite at Cheltenham. Do you remember mm -hmm. when he, he jumped the last, he went violently off towards the exit. And what was it? Was it Whisper or yeah, something? Yeah, it was. Went on. And Mike Bites come back and join him and beat him. And people will say, ah, that's because Nico, you know, got him going with his stick. Two reasons I disagree. He has passed the danger point, you know, which mm -hmm. is going out to the exit. And he's now aimed at the stables at the top of the run-in. 
two reasons. Horses are like homing pigeons. They know where the stables are. So I will maintain till I die that my bike, yes, of course, Nico was brilliant to, to keep going and get him going. But he's gone so far over, he meets the running rail, he's past the exit, home is up there. I want to go back to Crisp because I want to talk about his positive attributes and the ability that he had to get into that position in the first instance. And of all those horses that Fred Winter had at the time, was he fundamentally the most talented? He was very, very fast. I mean, he won the two-mile champion chase by 25 lengths. Yeah. You know, he was a very fast horse. Um, he had his quirks. He pulled like a train, you know. Oh, he was very strong, but his ability to jump was fantastic. So he, did he take control of you in the middle of that Grand National? No, and, uh, no, and this is something, that, you know, they think I was brainless. No, we had worked the race through beforehand. He was so exuberant, when he saw a fence, he went, yeah, hey, you know, let's have it. And he would quicken of his own volition going in. Now at Aintree, a lot of horses go, oh, 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 okay. He was, wow. And he would land, he was quite low at them, and he would land galloping and be away. So at one single fence, mm -hmm. he could gain a length, two lengths, whatever you let him. He was never so strong that I couldn't hold him. Look at Beecher's Brook then. I, look at the gap on the inside there, a big hole. And that's where Kilburn fell in 1969. Carberry up the inner where the brave men go and you, if you land a bit steep you land in that hole you went backwards into the ditch. Things have changed. Tell me about the thrill of riding entry then. There's nothing like it Nick and, I've, and I'm a good loser which is a bad thing you know McCoy was mm. a great winner, Dunwoody, Skew, Frank and all these good jockeys were great winners. I was a good loser because in the National, to ride a horse of his calibre at speed over those obstacles when they were took some jumping was such a thrill. Now, obviously, those few seconds when I was near the post but then beaten, you're utterly desolated. But by the time I pulled the horse up, I'm now elated. I'd had the best ride, the best experience that money couldn't buy. You know, it doesn't matter how rich. Nelson Bunker Hunt, the silver man at the time, he couldn't have ridden him. A, he was 17 stone, but B, you know, I'd earned the ride on him, and the ride was fantastic. So I'm the only winner. Poor Sir Chester Manifold, who owned him, uh, Chipper Chape, who used to ride him and look after him every day, devastated. Fred was, you know, the stable, the punters, the crowd, devastated. How did you feel that night? Elated, because I'd had the ride of my life. To jump beaches twice as if it didn't exist. You know, jumped so far out over it, it was none of this nodding bit. What about in, in, in the years subsequently that you oh. sort of almost feel you have to introduce yourself as the guy that got beaten on yeah, the yeah, rest yeah. rather than the yeah, man yeah. who rode all yeah, these yeah. wonderful horses? Yeah. Does, that annoy, does that bother you? No, it doesn't bother me but it, 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 because I am a truthful person and I know that it was my own basic stupidity that caused it. So. Of course I agonised over that, but you can't go back. I no. made the decision at the time and that, that was that. And it's the first thing people ever say. I did a speaking tour in Flemington for a week and roundabout, and you know, they, a lot, I got a lot of ribbing mm. there. Uh, and, and what was quite well, The funny, Australians aren't going to let you lie. No, no, no. Was, the chairman asked me in on the second weekend, there was the crisp hurdle there, into his inner sanctum, and, you know, about 12 people for lunch, you see two paintings. The first ever Melbourne Cup winner, mm -hmm. which I'm afraid I can't remember. Oh, and Crisp, me, sitting on Crisp, you see. <laughs> so I said, oh, that was great. And he'd been bred there by Sir Chester Man Manifold, who was chairman of uh, Flemington. Anyway, a day went on and I, I said, look, I really want to go and feel what it's all about. And I went to the stables, I went everywhere, and I just popped in to thank him at the end of the day. Crisp painting, had gone. <laughs> <laughs> removed without trace. Yeah. <laughs> he was a very talented horse. How, how do you rate Pendle against him? Equal. We Both horses, uh, when I rode them, beat Tingle Creek, who in, you know, older people's brains, the fastest two-miler. Well, he wasn't. We beat him with both of them, and we broke track records at Newbury and Kempton. Mm -hmm. They were both very, very fast. Uh, Pendle, 
uh, of course Chris was known as a two mile chaser, he won yeah. the two mile chase uh, and everyone says Pendle didn't stay, I won't have that but you know, we all have our own thoughts on this. Um, but Pendle was an amazing little thing, he was clocked uh, unofficially by the starter's car at Chepstow where he was bolting up, you know, over the la between the last two, 42 miles an hour at See, the end of a race. What interests me about, about your comments is that people don't associate 1970s jumpers with being fast, but yeah, speed yeah. It was, was their major oh. asset, and the same yeah. probably applies to the Lanzarotis and Bueller's as well. Was it something Fred Winter was doing? Was he just a better trainer? Was he able to impart that speed into horses whilst other trainers were watching their big chasers plod round, or was he just no. unfortunate to get this group no. of very talented animals? Fred was a very good trainer, and what he did, he, he realised as a jockey, he had had no dealings with horses, even though his father had been a trainer. He had no actual dealings, day-to-day -day dealings mm. with them. He used to get up, ride them, go to the races, etc. He employed an elderly head lad who'd been around to feed and have some jurisdiction in the yard. Um, and he did, he worked out for himself how he wanted to train them, but it was exactly the same as Foot Warwin, and Stan Miller started training then, and a few other big ones there. They did the same thing, you know, round the round bowl at Mandan and up the back of the hill. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it didn't change much, no. It didn't matter what distance they were. No, we didn't try and put speed into them. They just had it. They were just naturally talented yeah, horses. Yeah, yeah. but the, the art is in keeping them mentally you know, right, and keeping them sound. Uh, as we see now every year, the health of the stable is so important, isn't it? I mean, it's nothing the trainer does or doesn't do. Mm. It can be a bad batch of hay, you know, the feed's wrong because it's come from a mill that did cattle feed before that had something else in it, and, y y you know, it, Keeping them healthy is the thing. There's received wisdom amongst people who were who are historians of that era that Killiney was the best of the lot, or would have been the best of the lot had he not suffered a fatal injury. Is that something you agree with? It, it, it was, and there's something the public wouldn't have known at that time. I think he won nine of his ten, and he'd, he'd won a few before I got on him. Uh, uh, a great horse he was, big, slightly you need to make him drive but he'd jump he'd love to be made to do what he what he did but um Kalini had a breathing problem and this is a bugbear in mind mm -hmm. i hate people saying a wind up how can joe soap not joe soap your ordinary punter mm -hmm. in the in the and around know what a wind up is or a jockey has dropped his hands whoa where are they <laughs> he stopped riding not dropped his hands. so anyway we were going to do a breathing operation on his respiratory area that summer. So how good would he have been? We just won the the Sun Alliance by mm -hmm. twenty odd lengths. And he couldn't breathe. Yeah, it made a noise, terrible right. noise. So right. how good would he have been, Nick? I mean, you've seen uh, Paul Nichols being a, a great promoter of, of wind surgery, breathing surgery, and and. It's amazing. It must have been very strange for you riding horses at sort of all time great horses. Were you conscious of the time of their place in history? I, I, I think we were because they were winning big races regularly. I mean, I only rode Beulah for one hurdle race, the elite hurdle, at, which he won at Wincanton, and then his novice chase season. Mm -hmm. Five runs, one four, fell in the other one. Um, and then Fred Winter quite naturally said, look, John Franklin had come up by then. He said, look, John is the best jockey ever to ride over a fence. You know, he's the he's natural, you, he, yeah. you know, do you, no, he didn't say, do you mind, but this will happen. I hope you don't mind, but you'll be all right. And what about Lanzarotti? Lanzarotti, flat horse, Lord Howard de Walden, all right, stayed, couldn't jump. He was hopeless. He used to come through, we've got several photographs at home of him coming through hurdles with his back legs first, you know, in, all in a heap, back legs out there. And we schooled him all his life over fences, even though he was hurdling and won the champion hurdle. He was schooling over fences. But he, lovely big black horse, decent flat horse without being a world beater. Shouldn't look round, should you? Jockeys don't do that. So no. decent flat horse without being a world beater, couldn't really jump. Yeah. So how did he become such a good hurdler? He was very, very honest and he stayed the trip nicely, went in the ground. He was, do you know what is so good and people don't realise it generally? 
horses will race a rail. And he was brilliant at Kempton, you know, a long old bend all the way into the straight. Mm. And I wouldn't ask him, but he would pick up, he'd get to that bend and, he, and he'd pick up and race that bend and get 10 lengths doing it without being asked. It, it just amazing horse. But there's quite a good story with the champion hurdle. It was in an era where Comedy of Errors mm -hmm. and he were, you know, Champion Hurdle, the, 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 was it the Irish Sweeps in mm -hmm. Ireland, all these, we kept meeting. Comedy was the better horse. And Fred Winter was a great man for talking to his jockeys and discussing it. And he said, how can we beat this horse in the Champion Hurdle? And I said, well, he's prone to going right-handed when under pressure, uh, Comedy of Errors. Let's put him under pressure. He said, right we'll run a pacemaker and we'll make this a real test of stamina. We'll make him make mistakes. So they put in a horse called Calzado, ridden by the assistant at the time, DC Stanhope from Ireland. DC made the running to the first, and then, <laughs> and then the horse stops, I was left in front. I can see him right you see, the back see him there, go, yeah. yeah, but you see, uh, Comedy Bearers went right-handed mm. there, you see, and that was what we decided to do. So. It worked. Now, Bill Smith says the horse wasn't right and it's all a load of rubbish, but you've seen for yourself, he went out right-handed. So we had made the plan and the plan came off. But here's his white face, bang. Oh, you see, he got low there, but I suppose I did ask him for a biggish one. But, oh, guy looked like a tractor driver. Yeah, but in, you say you always say that, but that was rather the style of the time. <laughs> Yes, apart from someone like David Mould and Bobby Beasley, who were absolutely way ahead. So why do jockeys look different now to how they did then in a race? Why has the style become more attractive, more elegant, more streamlined, they, more better to watch? Yeah, they've copied um, the American riders, but i am not in agreement with toes in the iron because it leads to if a horse stumbles or does that, mm. you're gone, you know. But they do tell me their toes are like steel now. But by having the toes in the iron rather than their feet shoved in, as we did, they, they think that it alters their balance on a horse, so they're more pivotal mm -hmm. over the withers. So the horse pivots underneath them, you know, and they, they can basically stay in that, that um, position. And on balance, after as you say, 35 years at the BBC and a, a glorious career as a rider before that. Uh, do you feel lucky to, to have been in the sport? Oh, yeah, yeah. I wrote an autobiography in 1976, said good horses make good jockeys, and, and I believe that. My next one, if I ever get round to it, will be should have done better. But I'm quite happy, you know, I, I, I'm happy with what I did. You're quite hard I, on yourself, aren't no, you? No, I'm not. I could have done better in many ways, but... Why? Well, with, with losing a Grand National and a Gold Cup that I should have won, you know. It's those horses, the owners deserved it. They, the punters deserved it. There's a good story, uh, can I, sorry, can I take over? Of course you can. There's a great story about Pendle and two Gold Cups. The first one, Fred had said to me in 1973, I enjoy yourself, you know, creep into the race, uh, and I want you to be in front two out. And I said, I want to be in front halfway up the running because he did used to stop. You, you wouldn't notice it because he was so mm. superior, but I could feel him curling under me in lots of races in these one by 20 lengths. The King George, you know, he's curling underneath you. He wanted company. So I said, I want to come halfway up the running. He said, I don't think you're clever enough to do that, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd rather you went to the last in front, and if you get beat, that's my fault. Uh, the Dickler came past me because he froze, a little pendle froze. The, the sight of the colour, Nick, mm. but also the noise when you jump the last, you know, it's, it, it, and it the hits you. a big, huge horse. And a little pendle went, ooh, and lost momentum. The Dickler's got back. That's given Pendle the oomph, and he was in front of stride after the line, but they pay on the line. Mm. And that reminds me, just going back, you asked me about Fred Winter, mm -hmm. and I think I showed you a photograph. He's beaten the short head in the Gold Cup. He's won it himself numerous times. There's the handprint where he's patted Pendle on his backside and said, well done, old boy. And he's got his two arms on me saying, you couldn't have done any better. A great man. Look at that. Yeah. I mean, wasn't that good? He should have been kicking my backside. And there he is saying, well, you did your best. Great man. Richard, for the moment, thank you very much. I know you're going to stay with us. I feel like we're barely scratching the surface.
but our time for the moment is up. <laughs> Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.